Many loyal listeners have been in touch to ask about a number that was widely reported recently, that e-cigarettes are 95% less harmful than ordinary cigarettes. The source was a report from Public Health England. Now, it's not surprising that a product containing nicotine and not much else might be less damaging than a cancer stick loaded with tar and other toxins. But the figure of 95% seemed to come from nowhere. Was it, to quote loyal listener Paul Friend, a made-up statistic? Well, the number originally came from a piece of work led by Professor David Nutt of Imperial College London and Larry Phillips, Emeritus Professor of Operational Research at the London School of Economics. The number emerged neither from thin air nor from a statistical analysis, but from a kind of structured group discussion called multi-criteria decision analysis. I asked Larry Phillips to explain what his group had done to estimate how much harm e-cigarettes might do. Well, you begin by deciding what you mean by harm, and that took a long time. So we first had to make sure that we had a variety of people with different perspectives, and there were a lot of people. People who know about the science of addiction, people who know about nicotine, people who have treated people who have smoking problems, anybody you could think of who has something to contribute to the judgment about harm should have been represented in that room. And how many people in the end were in the room? Oh gosh, it was about 20. I said, don't get just people agreeing with each other. I want specifically people who will disagree with each other. And we have to work through what do we mean by harm. Once Phillips had assembled his experts for a day of structured discussion and debate, he asked them to work through some key decisions. First, what products to include? Cigarettes, snuff, patches, gum, e-cigarettes, etc. Then, what kind of hazards were worth considering? The first one, of course, was dying directly from an overdose. That was at the top of the list. Which is a concern for heroin and, exactly. and, and, and alcohol, but probably not cigarettes. No, 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 no. And that's why we distinguished between product-specific mortality, which means dying from an overdose, from product-related mortality, like death due to cancer, respiratory illnesses, cardiovascular disease, and fire. So, they have a set of potentially harmful products and a list of the kinds of harm they can do. Start fires, give cancer to bystanders, cause heart attacks, and so on. Then, the expert group works through each product and considers how dangerous it is across each of these categories of harm on a scale of 1 to 100. Where they can, this number is based on data, but with a relatively new product such as e-cigarettes, there isn't much data. So the experts have to supply an educated guess. And of course, not every harm is equal. Let's say, for example, that it's easier to take a fatal overdose of nicotine using e-cigarettes than with cigars. But the importance of this risk of an accidental overdose is minimal compared with the risk of cancer or respiratory disease. First, we look at all the harms to the user and say, which one do we care the most about? Well, it was product-specific morbidity, the ways that it can make you ill. And that one eventually got the biggest weight, put a weight of 100 on that one. When we look at that scale for product-related morbidity, cigarettes is worst. Now, when we look at some other scale, we then have to make a judgment. If that first scale is given a, a weight of 100, what's the weight on the other? If you think it's half as important, then you'd give it a 50. Now, here's where it gets kind of tricky, because these are definitely judgments. There's no data behind any of this. And this is always the case for anything that you have multiple criteria. This is a highly structured process. First, select the experts, then the products, then the categories of harm, then assess how harmful each product is in each category, and finally decide how important each category is. The end result of all this is a single number, summarising the harm from each product. But despite all the structure, it's also a highly subjective process. So why should we take the number seriously? Did you know all science is based on that? There is no such thing as an objective number. There's always wiggle worm around any number. So why should we be any different? The choice of experts seems to be absolutely critical. It is. And and also rather subjective. So how do you make sure you've got the right people in the room? I bet you wouldn't have asked that of the people who were in charge of deciding who the CERN, you know, that huge particle accelerator, but it was all subjective. How did you decide who to hire? 
N nobody asks that question of scientists. It's only when we get involved and make the judgments explicit and we turn them into numbers that people say, well, I'm not so sure about that. But if the number's based on a subjective analysis, wouldn't it be better to use words rather than a spuriously precise number? Larry Phillips says no. Imagine the way that information about a risk is passed up through the layers of a bureaucracy. A number, say a 10% risk of a terrorist attack, might be spuriously precise, but using words instead of that number creates a whole new set of problems. We have real experience showing that if you say, oh, it's very unlikely, at that level, the level of the spooks who are actually got the data, reporting that up very unlikely becomes, oh, it's unlikely. And you report it up to the next level, it's, no, it's, it's not likely. And as you report it upwards, slowly the uncertainty disappears. <laughs> There's evidence to show that when you're reporting something that's unsure, the best you can do is give a probability. Professor Larry Phillips of the London School of Economics.